Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Uh, it's a very high bar. I try to live to this high expectations. So it's already pretty late. Most of you I see, you know, probably should check your pulse. Maybe, maybe you can just stand up for a second. You know, just stretch your legs for a second. I know I need this as well. OK, great. Now sit down. <laughs> OK, great. Now I'll need, yeah. Let's see if I have this. It's this one. That's it, okay, and I press, let's see, okay, it works. So before I start, I see a few familiar faces here, so we're gonna start with a disclaimer. This is a green presentation, which basically means that some of the slides have been recycled, so. And it works, okay. So when thinking about today's lecture, initially I thought about telling you about the problem we're trying to solve and to, to scare you. Uh, and tell you about how enormous it is. But then I thought it's going to be probably much more interesting to tell you about the journey that we actually went through in MIMED, trying to be, well, not to solve the problem. I think solving this problem that I'm going to talk about, that's too much of a daunting task. All we want to do is be part of the solution. And how the team and I have been trying to be part of the solution and focus primarily on the challenges over the way. Now, translation here from Hebrew to, to English, when we say challenges, that's goddamn problems, okay? I always envy all these CEOs that have challenges. It's so cute, you live with a challenge. When you live with a problem, you try to solve it. So I'm gonna tell you today about our problems. Now, before that, I'm just gonna give you a snapshot meme it today. Here, we're here on the fifth floor, founded 2009 in Kfir, that's the other co-founders, grandmother's kitchen, headquarters in R&D lab in Haifa, beautiful view to the beach. We see the people that actually have a life. We're ISO 13485 certified, several financing rounds, blue chip VCs, Silicon Valley, Asia, quite a lot of non-diluted funding, about 17 to 18 million dollars just in the last 12 months from, that's in addition to VC funding, just, you know, EU commission, federal government that are trying to help us uh, materialize the dream. We have a team that includes thought leaders, including people here in Germany, in medicine, emergency medicine, infectious disease, molecular immunology, big data analytics, product, IP regulation, and we're all passionate about trying, oh, well, my wife says it's obsession. We're all obsessed with trying to solve the following seemingly simple problem, or, no, sorry, that's from a different uh, presentation. Here, I'm actually gonna tell you how we actually started this. Okay, so episode number one. Initially, I met Kfir, we were sitting in a coffee shop in Haifa, drinking some coffee and said, okay, let's build a company. And we had two observations. Observation number one, people are different. Well, sure, but they're managed clinically in a similar manner, and that's not something new. But what happened the last 10 years, and we've seen several lectures today, suddenly we can measure it very, very effectively. DNA, genomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, microbiome. So that's observation number one. Observation number two, well, diagnostics is, used, is using about 2% of all healthcare expenditures, but it's informing about 70% of our medical decision-making. So we said, okay, that's an opportunity. Great, let's build a company. But what the hell is our company going to do? Now, I don't know how many of you have ever had this feeling that you think about a problem and suddenly you have a eureka moment. How many of you have had this? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Okay, beautiful. We had nothing. Complete, utter darkness. For about a year, we didn't find any problem to solve. And then after a year, after coming with several imaginary problems that didn't really exist in medicine, we came up with the following seemingly simple problem. You come with your child to the doctor, they're sick, they have a fever, or maybe it's you and you feel sorry for yourself, or maybe it's your parents. And what often the physician is trying to figure out is well, whether you have a bacterial or a viral infection, whether to treat you or not to treat you with antibiotics. And the problem is that he or she often don't know because bacterial and viral infections are often clinically indistinguishable. Now, sure, there's many solutions out there. Again, we heard a little bit about that today. Things, for example, you can take culture and grow the bacteria in a dish, things called PCR, or rapid antigen tests, but they would usually suffer from one or more of the following verticals. First, prolonged time to results. Many of the solutions take a lot of time, about 48 hours to grow bacteria in a dish. Now, when I come with my daughters to the doctor, I don't want to wait 48 hours. I want a solution here, and I want it now. Number two, well, most of the technologies require access to the infection site, 
which is not always possible if you have an ear infection, it's behind your tympanic membrane, if it's in the lungs. Uh, so that's two. Number three, we just heard about the microbiome. It's also in the nose. Say you take the best technology, say a PCR, and you sample the nasal pharynx of a two-year-old child, and you identify a bacterial pneumococci. Who cares? Every second child, healthy child that you pick up on the, on the street random, will have a pneumococci, whether he's healthy or sick. And same goes for the most, most prevalent disease-causing agents on Earth. Basically, these bacteria and viruses are doing Tarzan from one nostril to another. So that's creating a lot of false alarms. Number four, they're just evolving so rapidly. By the time we develop a solution for one, they've already evolved, so our uh, sensitivity reduces. So time to results. A pathogen accessibility, false alarms due to your microbiome, and rapidly evolving and, uh, uh, pathogens. These are four major challenges in the field. Now, as a result of this, now we get to the problem. This seemingly simple problem gives rise to what is arguably today one of the biggest healthcare challenges of our time. Antibiotics misuse, or should I say, abuse. And there's several dimensions to the problem. I'm not going to talk about this too much. We can talk about this for days. But the first dimension is the overuse. Every second antibiotics is overprescribed to a non-bacterial infection, that is a virus usually, for which it was not supposed to be prescribed in the first place. Consequences? Well, first of all, we're about flushing down the toilet about 18 billion with a B dollars of a drug that was not supposed to be prescribed. We have adverse effects, for example, allergies and some others. But of course, the biggest of the problems is the rise of resistant strains of bacteria. Basically, through simple Darwinian evolution, they're creating resistance to the, to the antibiotics. And the reason people are so scared about this is that if we lose antibiotics, we lose modern medicine. You cannot treat cancer patients that would otherwise die due to a weakened immune response. You cannot sustain preterm infants. So it's a big thing. It's killing over 700,000 people today in the world, according to Jim O'Neill, one of the world-renowned economists, just was published about two weeks ago. And with an estimated about 70 million people by 2050, estimated cost a few trillions, not millions, not billions, trillions of dollars, lowering world GDP. Now, whether you accept these numbers or not, or say that this is a little bit over-exaggerated, the problem is big. The second part of the equation, and that's actually something that people don't know about, is that we also have underuse. At the same time, well, one in five children or adults that sh should receive antibiotics are not receiving it, even though they have a bacterial infection. Consequences, usually nothing dramatic. Sometimes, prolonged disease duration. So we as parents, for example, we lose nights of sleep. But sometimes, especially elderly patients, morbidity and even mortality. I'm not going to talk about the third part of the equation. There's some other societal consequences. OK, so now we have a problem. So when we started seven years ago, we imagined a solution. This is a rendering image. It's not the real thing. But we imagine this small benchtop device that with a drop of blood and a few minutes would give the physician all the information he or she needs in order to decide, well, is it a bacterial or a viral infection? Should I treat or not treat with antibiotics? That's it. Now, of course, we realize that whoever can do this is going to conquer a multi-billion dollar market. It's going to be a multi-billion dollar company. But that's Mount Everest. That's a holy grail. So we said, well, if we want to climb Mount Everest, we might as well stop at base camp. Otherwise, we're going to die from less of, uh, lack of oxygen. So what you see here on the right, that's another product that works in about two hours. The first one here on the right has already received regulatory approval. We're already using it to guide patient treatment. We're about 18 months line of sight from the second generation. So last piece of the puzzle, how do we do this? We knew we're not the only wise guys in the neighborhood, and that all the big players, the Roche, the Abbotts, the Siemens, we had today Siemens CEO, well, they've been working on this for 50, 60, 70 years. How could we compete? So we said, well, we have to find an unfair advantage. We have to cheat. And we said, well, most of the solutions, the common denominator, they're trying to grow the bacteria, they're trying to detect the viruses. We said, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to rely on a system that's within us that's much better than we could ever hope to develop as clinicians, scientists, and engineers. And I'm, and I'm alluding to your immune system. So your immune system is actually the perfect mechanism. It's a deadly weapon to identify bacterial and viral infections and to mount specific attacks against them. All you, all you do is listen to the war that's being waged and see whether the body is using the commando, antiviral commando, or the antibacterial rangers, or what have you. And through a set of 
biochemical sensors and through sophisticated algorithms, you translate that into simple barcode, if you will, of the host response, telling the physician bacterial, viral, or non-infectious etiology. That's the concept. Okay, so we are already in episode number three. So now we have a problem and a conceptual solution. But then it turned out that ideas are easy. Making products is hard. So let me give you a very short uh, uh, account of that and a little bit about how we failed to raise money initially. So challenge number one, or problem number one, where do we look inside the body? There's a lot of potential molecules to look, DNA, RNA, proteins. To make a very, very long story short, we focus on proteins. Everything I tell you here, for the professional people in the audience, is proteins. We have some things do done on RNA. Proteins are very hard to do R&D, but once you know what you want to measure, it's easy, not easy, but easier to do it in a small form factor that's affordable and quantitative. So everything is proteins, okay. And now we went through this series of events. Initially, we said, okay, where do we find these proteins? There's more than 100 years of immunology. Usual suspects, again, for the professionals here in the audience from life science, we look at cytokines, interleukines, pro, uh, procalcitonin, and CRP. If, if those of you who are non-professional here from life science, if you don't remember this, it doesn't really matter, because it failed. And so we, took, we just took the blood of our family and friends, infected them with different bacteria and viruses, and it didn't work. And so we said, well, one, one of the reasons it didn't work, by the way, is because the fact that something participates in the immune response doesn't mean it's differentially uh, expressed. So where do we find these hypothetical uh, molecules? Every one that we measure, by the way, in the lab costs us about several thousand dollars. You have over 100,000 potential candidates. That's a few hundreds of millions of dollars of seed financing. Of course, we couldn't have that. We couldn't have find a dollar. And um, we don't have enough blood in the Israeli population. So, we went the Google way. We built these crawlers that went on the net and sucked to our servers every piece of data that's ever been put out there on infectious disease. And a year into the process, we've reduced this infinite list to 600 proteins, repeated the experiment on the top 20. We didn't have money for everything. 18 crap. Two of them lit up. We were so excited. Got a term sheet from a venture capitalist who then took it back. And we asked, why? And they said, well, in vitro, outside the body, is not in vivo, inside the body. What about fit, uh, kidney filtration, lymphatic communication, proteases, which are little Pac-Mans in your body that are chewing up everything? So we said, okay, the only way we're going to convince ourselves, the world and ourselves, that this is actually meaningful is to do a small-scale clinical study. Got on board a few hotshot clinicians for a little bit of equity and a lot of goodwill. Ran a small-scale clinical study, 25 bacterial, 25 viral. One of the molecules died on the journey from in vitro to in vivo, and one of them survived. And at that point, we became first time financeable after about a year and a half, two years, and then ran very fast. Small scale, medium scale, and large scale clinical studies enrolling many, many thousands of patients. Let me show you one of the clinical studies. It was finished in 2013. I see we don't have a lot of time here, but the organizer told me I can also steal another five minutes, so, okay. So, 2013, a, we actually waited two years until we published the results because we knew it's going to create a, a storm. And we wanted to make sure we're not seeing faces in the cloud. So this is the first study. 1,002 patients, prospective. We measured all the 600 proteins that I told you about. So as far as we know, it's the largest characterization of the human response on the protein level to infections. Most of the proteins, again, crap. A few of them were okay, a subset were really good, but then again, it was about finding the right combination. And over there, we used a lot of AI, et cetera, et cetera. So let me show you the proteins. Initially, it was very secretive. We gave them names of ice creams, toffee, cherry, pecan, mocha. Let me show toffee. The actual name is trail. It's a molecule here. This is a little bit of science. Each dot here is a patient, a 93-year-old lady or a three-month-year-old baby. Each dot here indicates you know, the amounts in the viral patient cohort or the bacterial, and you see this tended to shoot up in your bloodstream when you have a viral infection, and when down, you have a bacterial infection. It was the most informative protein that we could find, but it was not good enough when you work at this in isolation. We don't have a perfect biomarker. We don't have a magic bullet. We and nobody, I think. But then you add to the, to the piece, to the puzzle, another one which is routinely used called CRP that goes up with bacteria, and another one that has another dynamics, which is called IP10, and together gave us a pretty robust result. It's what you see in the first publication in the blue. The sensitivity, that's the accuracy that we detect bacterial infections. Specificity is the accuracy that we detect viral infections. 
Is it good? Well, 94 means that 6%, we're missing 6% of bacterial infections, we're reducing it from a 20% missing, so that's about 3.5 reduction. And the fact that we're doing 93% specificity means that we're missing 7% of the viral infection, we're giving antibiotics, that's an improvement from 40%, so that's about four, four-fold reduction. But more importantly, the fact that we're using the immune system is not just a cool gimmick. It's not just a geeky, cool nuance. It enables you to overcome the challenges we talked about in the beginning. A, it's fast. You can measure it in minutes. Second, it can diagnose inaccessible infections because your immune system goes behind your tympanic membrane and into your lungs. Third, we've shown, we've measured actually the microbiome. Where did you go from microbiome? We measured the microbiome and showed that if that pneumococca is not attacking the body, by and large, the immune system doesn't counterattack. So it's an elegant way to overcome this problem. We didn't solve it, the immune system did. And lastly, we went through all the epidemics and found out the H1N1 swine flu, if you remember, and H2N3, and we found that the signal is pretty robust. Okay, I'm gonna skip this just because it's really beautiful stuff, but uh, I see I'm running out of time, so I can talk about that later on. I'm just gonna tell you that, well, Right now, we're running about 10 clinical studies, prospective, over 10,000 patients. We just won a prize, the most promising biotech company, medical device company in Europe, out of 90 companies. Got a $4 million prize, and we're actually sharing this here with a, a professor, Tobias Welter from Hanover Medical Center, who's the head of the Pulmonology Society in Germany. So that's study here, almost at the, top, at the top. It's gonna be 1,100 uh, elderly patients here in Germany, and we have some other collaborators here in Germany. Okay, so last piece I wanna tell you, Discovery is not validation, and validation is not really helping patients. And I think Yogi Berra said this very nicely. Well, in theory, practice is like theory, but in practice it's not. So we're sitting around the room, boardroom, about, again, two or three years ago. We said, it doesn't matter how smart we are, or think we are, well, we're not gonna be able to anticipate how the market is going to react to this. This is what Gadi was talking about early on today. So let's just make an imperfect product. It doesn't work still in 15 minutes, it's gonna take two hours. Put it out there, get punches in the face. You usually do that in internet, launch and learn. You don't do this in biotech. But he said, let's do this in biotech. Let's get punched in the face, learn, improve. So by the time we have the holy grail, we already incorporate all this know-how. So this was the first product, ImmunoExpert. It works in two hours, CIVD approved. Uh, we already use it in over 5,000 children. It's part of routine care. Uh, let me just give you an example. This is how the user interface of this product looks like. It's a, like, a, like a thermometer, but an Im, Im, immunometer, if you will. Numbers between a zero and a hundred. This is a child coming to a major hospital in Israel. Suspicion of viral infection. They send him home. Get this, 90% bacterial infection. They come back. It turns out to be a peritonsular bacterial abscess. This is the type of material that pediatrician nightmares are made of. You don't want to miss that. That's one example. This is my favorite example. Three-year-old child, really, really cute. The mother was hysterical, a fever for about two days. The father, a really nice guy, had to go on a business trip. The mother was asking the father, well, what, what, do, what does the daughter have? The father said, I have absolutely no clue. So the mother says, the shoemaker is going barefoot. So I took my daughter to one of the medical centers uh, where they're running the ImmunoExpert, and we ran the score. You see here it's a 99% viral infection, 1% bacterial infection. We didn't treat with antibiotics. She was back uh, in the kindergarten after about uh, 24 hours, and I got to be the hero of the house, my wife, and of course, most importantly, my mother-in-law. Uh, some people here you see are, are smiling. Some are, 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 are scared a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna skip this. This is how an adoption curve looks like. And I'm gonna, let me see, I'm gonna skip this as well, because I'm almost out of time. I'm just gonna say that, well, this is the second generation product. It's again, it's a rendering image. We still haven't unveiled how it's gonna finally look like. We're about 18 months line of sight from the second generation. And episode number five, well, you see it's blank. We're actually writing it these days. I don't wanna end, if, you know, before I just mention, you know, what you see here at the top is the, I think, you know, the brilliant and vibrant team at Mimit, and here are all our collaborators from all over the world. And thank you for the organizers for inviting, inviting me here to share the story. <laughs>